Hello everyone, we'll get started in just a second. I'm gonna add my special guest here, so bear with us. We have some really um, exciting guests today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about alpha-gal syndrome, and we have the two alpha-gals. And let's see if we can get them. Hey, Carrie. There they are. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome. We'll just give it another second while people are joining. Um, we have a few technical uh, glitches, which uh, I think is uh, not all that uncommon, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would be an Instagram Live if we didn't have at least a few, uh, a few technical problems. So we'll, uh, we'll just, I'm already getting some hearts and some waves. It's always great to see you guys have, have, have a big following. I know the, uh, our uh, Ask the Insider does as well. So hopefully we're going to have a lot of interactions today. Um, all right. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. It's four minutes after. Um, hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for spending a piece of your Friday with us. Um, this episode of Ask the Insider, uh, we're going to uh, welcome our two guests that you can see on the screen, Debbie and Candace, otherwise known as the two alpha gals. Um, we're going to take a look inside of what it's like to actually have alpha gal syndrome, and we'll talk about Debbie and Candace and what they've been doing, not only for themselves, but also for the greater alpha gal syndrome community to really help people live their best lives. I'm your host, otherwise known as the insider today, Gary Falsitano. I'm a licensed PA for over 25 years. I have extensive background and experience in emergency medicine, disaster medicine, primary care, and also allergy and immunology. For the past 10 years, I've been been the, um, the clinical affairs manager for allergy at Thermo Fisher Scientific. And in that role, I actually interact with allergists from around the world, including some that were instrumental in the initial identification and understanding of alpha-gal syndrome. So right from the beginning, um, you know, I, I've been able to, to kind of speak with people who really uh, identified and, and, and allowed so many people like Deb Debbie and Candace to get answers to their symptoms that they've been suffering with. So as I said, um, I, I am joined today by the two alpha gals, Debbie and Candace. Uh, they're co-founders of Two Alpha Gals. Um, they've been featured on the Today Show, on the Skim. They've discussed their, uh, each of their journeys, really, on their road to getting their alpha gal diagnosis and then, and then leading the best lives possible since the diagnosis. They also have a podcast called In the Tall Grass, as well as a website, a blog, um, multiple guides with tips to uh, really living alpha gal safe. So Debbie and Candice, welcome. Great to see you guys again. Um, why don't we start out with just having you guys introduce yourself, kind of talk about who you are, kind of what, what, what your mission is, and then we'll get to your, your personal stories and your, and your diagnosis stories in a little bit. Sure, that sounds great. <laughs> okay, thank you for having me. We're really excited to be here. I'm Debbie Nichols, um, and this is Candice Mathis, and together we're two alpha gals. And um, after a long journey, which I know we'll talk about more later, uh, Candace and I were diagnosed in 2018 and 2019, and just sort of seeing the lack of information that was available, we decided that we had to do something about it. So that's why we started to Alpha Gals to raise awareness of Alpha Gal syndrome, and also to try to help people navigate living with Alpha Gal syndrome without having to sacrifice joy. And we live here in Southwest Virginia, for anyone that may not know that. Um, Debbie and I were actually friends very briefly for my acute onset of what I now know as Alpha Gal. Um, so we became fast <laughs> friends from a, or one of our dear mutual friends, Chris Chittenden, actually invited her birthday lunch and we bonded over me not, um, <laughs> including croutons on my salad at lunch because I have a weed allergy. <laughs> and I knew right away we were going to be friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I definitely want to hear more about that too. Um, so, yeah, we'll get back to your stories, but I think where we should start, right, especially for those people that, that really don't know what alpha gal syndrome is, we should probably start there. And, and you know, we, we often see in, our, in the comments, um, you know, what is alpha gal? How do I get it? Um, you know, how do I get rid of it? Right. Is there is there a cure? Um, what are the symptoms? 
Um, so, so I'll start, but um, you guys have really become, right, with, with, with all of your um, kind of, you know, various activities and interviewing various guests, you, you guys have really become probably a lot, um, you know, more expert on this disease syndrome than uh, I would say a lot of primary care physicians and maybe even some allergists. So we'll definitely, I, I want to I hear from you as we go along as well. Um, so I'll, I'll start. So, so alpha-gal syndrome is um, primarily, but not exclusively, a food allergy, right? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an allergy to red meat or specifically mammalian meat. Um, and it has some pretty interesting um, aspects to it that make it difficult to diagnose and, and actually difficult to live with. So, so one of the, uh, the main differences between this food allergy and, and I hate to say common, but, but you know, kind of usual food allergies is the fact that it's it's most often delayed. So um, it's it you know when you have the symptoms, it's typically two, three, four, even eight hours after actually ingesting or being exposed to those meat proteins. And again, we're talking about red meats, mammalian meats. So we're talking about beef, lamb, pork, and then everything else that you can possibly think of that people might eat that are mammals. So you know, as as crazy as kangaroo meat or or venison or you know any any mammal that that people ingest can certainly um, be a cause of it. And then there's also byproducts, right? There's products that we make from mammals that also can contain alpha gal and and be. Um, you know, be an issue for some people with alpha gal syndrome. So the other really unusual aspect of this um, food allergy is that people become sensitized to alpha gal in an unusual way. So it's through a tick bite, and that tick is, um, is predominantly the Lone Star tick, especially in the southeast where Debbie and Candace are. Um, it has um, been transmitted by other ticks identified in the same family in the Oxidase uh, family of ticks from, uh, actually around the world. So alpha-gal has been um, found on every continent in the, in the world except for Antarctica. Um, and it's definitely becoming more and more prevalent. Um, in the U.S., it, was, it, it started out as being a, a Southeast U.S. issue, right? And that's where we, we saw the predominant, I and mean, that's where we still see the, you know, the majority of the cases, but we're seeing them as far no north as the Northeast in the upper Midwest. We're seeing it as far west as California, um, and maybe not just ticks that transmit it. There's been reported cases in the, in the literature of chiggers actually transmitting it as well, and, and also ticks that we don't really uh, um, think of as ticks, as seed ticks. And I know one of you guys has a story about that as well. Yeah. Um, so so I, that's the basis of, of kind of alpha-gal syndrome, but there's so much more we could probably spend hours talking about. Um, but let's kind of, um, let me just cover maybe, maybe diagnosis um, and I, before we get to diagnosis, because anything, anything in medicine, we don't just do a test, right? We, we need to have clinical history. We need to have suspicion. And as part of that history, we want to know about symptoms. So I'm going to ask you guys, because you guys are very knowledgeable on what your own personal symptoms were, but also what you're hearing as the most common symptoms. What, what do those look like? When should people suspect that they, you know, they may be have an alpha-gal syndrome or an alpha-gal sensitization? So, I mean, the, the symptoms can be very well heard you know, from people. I know Debbie dealt with this for years of strictly GI distress and issues, um, GI variant to it. Um, it's kind of ranging from hives all the way to um, joint pain, anaphylaxis. Um, there is just kind of this wide brain fog. I mean, there's I feel like there's so there's so many variations to the symptom, you know, severity with mm -hmm. people. Um, am I missing anything? I think those are the main ones. Yeah. Just that it <clears throat> looks so different from person to person, and it seems to imitate all different kinds of other conditions and diseases. Right. They used to call syphilis the great masquerader, but I think you know it may be a good title for for alpha gal syndrome as well. Uh, I would agree. I would agree. I don't know if you want us to get into any of this yet, but. Um, um, <laughs> well, I was going to say there's some there's some there's some common symptoms, right? So so typically with you know immediate food reactions, they're similar, right? With 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 alpha gals, and I think you mentioned some of them. So you right. know hives, mm -hmm. um, you know itching, uh, especially um, itching at the site of a previous tick bite is is another uh, area that seems to be the the most itchy spot on some people when they actually have an alpha gal reaction, right. um, but also. 
you know, the common symptoms that you think of for allergic reactions. So you can, you know, you can have, um, you know, nasal congestion, you can have throat tightness, you can have, you know, upper airway itching or, or feeling like it's closing, right? Those are all the, the, the symptoms we think about for anaphylaxis. I listened to one of your, um, your In the Tall Grass podcasts uh, recently, and, and you guys were talking about um, kind of some of those, those atypical um, symptoms. Right. So and that, that you that you've both um, kind of experienced. And, you know, I, I think the problem with the atypical ones and, you know, coming from from, um, you know, allopathic medicine, we tend to be doubters. Right. <laughs> so when we hear when we hear a symptom that we haven't learned, um, we tend to say, well, that's not from this. Right. And and but that but as we're learning. Right. The more you know about medicine, the more you don't know. And, <laughs> and <laughs> I think, you know, so, t so tell me, what were some of those those atypical symptoms that you guys actually experienced? Well, for me, um, the things that surprised me included, like you said, that throat itchiness. Like I didn't, I'd never really experienced that before. I'd had hives plenty of time, times before, plenty of GI reactions, but that throat itchiness was really um, surprising for me. And also, um, we, we, Candace and I call it drop, the feeling of dropping out, but it's really sort of a feeling of impending doom, like knowing something or feeling something is really bad is about to happen. Yeah, and I would add for me, I didn't know that anaphylaxis actually included low blood pressure. So I would get really lightheaded and almost pass out. And I probably needed to use my EpiPen at least 10 times. I mean, it's like... <laughs> a wonder that things didn't go to like a shock. Level. Yeah, and, th and that's, you know, that's a very common anaphylactic sim symptom, but I think you're right. I don't think a lot of people realize that it can just be what we call cardiovascular collapse, right? Or what happens is our, our blood vessels dilate, right? In, in response to that allergic reaction. And that, because there's more room now in, in that container, right? Our blood pressure drops. Um, the impending doom is interesting. Um, I started my career before I was a PA as a paramedic. And when patients had that sense of impending doom, we knew there was, it was a real problem that we really needed to kind of, you know, quickly address and, and fix what was going on. So that's also a very common um, um, term that we hear from, from people, not just with allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, but also, you know, in general with pretty severe illnesses. Um, but I, you, you reminded me on, on that podcast, I, you, you talked about also um, not realizing that anaphylaxis, which is two body systems, that you thought initially that anaphylaxis had to be, I can't breathe, my throat's closing, something really super like you're about to die and not just hives and GI or itchy throat and GI, right? Um, so, so yes, talk a little bit about that and how that was a big realization for you. Gosh, I mean, I, like I said, I I'd had anaphylactic events for so many months and didn't realize that that's what was happening to me. And it wasn't until I actually used my EpiPen for the first time. And what Debbie was just saying with that impending doom feeling, I just want to touch on this really fast that it's really hard to decipher in a lot of situations between being anxious and that and listening to that feeling. And I think that was the hardest thing for the longest time for me was, am I overreacting? Am sure. I, and it wasn't until I had an ER physician validate that for me that I never had an, a physician tell me, why did you use your EpiPen? It was, why did you not use your EpiPen? You know, so I think it took me a really long time to understand that. And I think that's why we're so passionate about being, you know, raising awareness around that, that subject matter, because it's like we suffered or at least I suffered unnecessarily for so long because I was scared to use my EpiPen. But now once I used it, I mean, my husband even got emotionally like upset when I used it the first time because he, he was like, oh my gosh, this is what you've needed. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if I just totally answered your question or not, but it-, it No, was I think you did. And I, I think that's a really important, um, I, it, it, I don't think it, we, there's a more important concept to get through to people today is that if you need the EpiPen, you should use it as soon as you need it, as quickly as possible. You know, in the, in the you know, it, it's not, again, it's, it's, it can be life-threatening, obviously. Anaphylaxis kills people. Um, and in the, you know, the documented cases of people, especially with food allergy, but also with insect sting allergy, um, the, the people that end up 
typically dying from their anaphylaxis are ones that waited too long for that initial epinephrine. Right. So, you know, I think people are afraid of the epinephrine. You know, it's, it's been really dr dramatized in movies, you know, with people jumping yeah. up, you know, and doing, and, and, and really it's not something we need to be afraid of. And I think you did a great, you know, you did a great job of explaining that, you know, you've used it quite a few times um, and you've never had any adverse effects other than improving your symptoms. No, and can I just add, it, it's great to hear you validating it as well, because we have spent so much time being um, dismissed by, you know, some of the top medical professionals. You're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. All your tests come back. And so to hear you say that using the EpiPen or having that feeling of impending doom are really valid feelings. I, like, I just want to echo, I think it's so important for people to hear yeah. And, you know, I, I think, you, you know, you talked about your, and we'll talk about your journeys in just a minute, but, um, you know, certainly early on when it wasn't a known syndrome, um, it, it can sound a little like it's in your head, right? Uh -huh. uh, having the, these symptoms that don't match, they're certainly not related to any, any recent ingestion or, or exposure. So, it, you know, it doesn't fit that paradigm that the medical professionals are, you know, are, are used to. Right. Sometimes it, you know, it, it takes a little bit. Not everybody's a house, right? So um, I do want to get back, though, to the diagnosis, and then we'll talk to you about your individual stories. So, um, you know, early on when this was identified, there was no diagnostic for it. Um, you know, we, we can do um, it's skin testing with, with meat extracts. It's not very good, and it's not very reliable. Um, and um, one of the early researchers that, you know, really identified and was putting all the pieces together uh, about alpha-gal syndrome um, actually put um, alpha-gal onto one of our immunocaps, the, the, um, the, the allergy uh, blood test, specific IgE blood test, and um, it made it as a research in, in his laboratory. And that really was the beginning of us bringing a, you know, the diagnostic alpha-gal um, before the FDA, which was finally cleared in 2000, I think you were both diagnosed, I'm, I'm sorry, um, 2020, I think you were both diagnosed before 2020, is that correct? Yes. And yes. So you were diagnosed with the research assay at the time, it wasn't an FDA cleared assay at the time, but now it's widely available to, for people in all the major laboratories. Um, so let's, let's um, unless you have anything to add around the diagnosis, um, I, let's let's go to your individual stories and kind of the, the kind of the, you know kind of briefly talk about the struggles you had initially. Okay, so I'll start because I guess <laughs> I always mine kind of starts. I don't know. Um, so, 2007, I was bitten by a seed tick. Um, my husband and I were in Floyd, Virginia, and it was on my toe for probably three days. I was very largely pregnant. I thought it was a speck of dirt, so I had no. Say, tell us what a seed tick is. So, I mean, I guess it's just like the larva, right, of of a tick. So it was tinier than a poppy seed. It literally looked like a speck of dirt. Mm -hmm. And um, so I ended up developing GI issues a month later. At the time, I didn't have a bullseye rash. I, you know, had a doctor check it out, but they didn't really look for anything other than the bullseye rash at the time or, you know, talk about any other tick-borne diseases. So fast forward, things kind of, you know, were up and down for years. I was diagnosed with a wheat allergy about a year after that bite and I eliminated gluten, things kind of improved, but I was always sensitive to and dairy and I never really understood why, but I had GI, just GI issues. So in 2017, I think, or 18, I was actually rebitten by something. I still don't know what it was to this day. Um, and then I sought out um, the guidance of a functional medicine doctor just for some fatigue and these underlying issues and was put on 11 different supplements. They were all gel caps. They were all bovine and porcine derived. And I woke up five days after taking those supplements to seeing double room spinning or sign meaning being yeah. cow and, and pig right, right. so the, those gelatin caps were, were were from those yeah okay. i'm they, sorry yes also in the you know the supplement themselves had extra <laughs> it was just <laughs> all the mammal so um i actually woke up to seeing double in the room spinning my heart rate was over 200 i didn't have a blood pressure cuff at that time but i almost passed out and now talking with my immunologist, he was like, you are having an anaphylactic reaction. 
at that time. So that was things just got very acute for me. I went from being extremely active, working out three days a week, taking my kids here and there to flatlined on the couch overnight. And my husband had to stay home with me for two weeks. We were told by the functional medical doctor, I have no idea what's wrong with you. Go to your PCP. So I went from PCP, ER, allergist, and I demanded to be sent to UVA. And great, I'm grateful we live where we do because I walked into UVA and they were like, we know what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> or we're pretty sure we know what's wrong with you based off of the, de the delayed reactions. Yes. So yeah. All the symptoms, they kind of... I kind of experienced the gamut of them, except for my throat closing. That was, you know, but I'd had hives at, at one point and all of that stuff. But um, I'll let Debbie share her story and then we can talk about how we kind of connected. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so UVA diagnosed you, they did, they did the specific IgE test and, and yes. confirmed the alpha-gal, correct? Yes, that's right. And, and, you know, it, it's worth mentioning, they were the epicenter of the, of really identifying this, this whole syndrome from the yep. beginning. So that Dr. was Platts very, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Tom Platts Mills, um, yeah, um, amazing, amazing clinician, physician, and researcher. Um, yeah. I, I work with him a lot and yeah. I, I saw him, so he's, he's an amazing physician. Yeah, yeah, who has AlphaGal himself. So. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, Let's, let's hear your story. Okay, so funny enough, it started around the same time as Candace, even though we were living in different parts of the state at that point. And it was just one of those things where I would have symptoms, whether it was GI issues, like severe GI issues, joint pain, brain fog, um, all of the things we've been talking about. And I would go to specialist after specialist and everybody was telling me there was nothing wrong with me. And so around 2015, after I'd had a big steak dinner at a wedding, I did realize that um, there was a connection between red meat and my stomach problems, but I didn't take it as any more than that. And then after sort of um, watching Candace go through what she went through with the acute stage, we were still relatively new friends and I didn't want to be like, hey, that sounds like what I have, you know? <laughs> I have that and I have, well once she was diagnosed I went and insisted on being tested and my test came back positive so um, a couple months after that was when um, I had an anaphylactic reaction and on, a, on board a cruise ship and the medical staff there didn't believe that I was having an allergic reaction to male meat that I hadn't ingested mm -hmm. and which was so entirely upsetting. And when I got off the ship, I don't even think if we'd left the, the port yet. I was like, Candace, we have to do something about this to raise awareness so that other people don't have to go through what we're going through, or at least we can try to help people shorten the time between the point that they're suffering to the point that they get some relief. Yeah. So, so that's amazing. So that was the, really the impetus to, to starting two alpha gals. Wow. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, to your point, I mean, I, hopefully it's, it's better now, but a study that was done in 2017 showed that 80% of people diagnosed with alpha gal syndrome took an average of seven years to get that diagnosis, which I, I'm hoping with the greater awareness and you guys have certainly played into that. Um, hopefully we have too as well with Allergy Insider, but um, yeah, hopefully we're, we're really shortening that time to getting the correct diagnosis. Um, yeah. We, we, we could speak for hours, but there, there, you know, there's so much stuff I want to talk to you about, but um, I, I really want to get to kind of, um, I, I think you've alluded to being empowered patients, you know, and, and we have a, a, an ongoing partnership this year with Zestful, um, where we, la we launched, you know, the hashtag empowered patient um, series, and we have a recent article that feature, uh, features the two of you. Um, that focuses, it's easy for me to say, focuses on living your best life, right? And and through really embracing, and I love these three pil pillars that, that you guys talk about, um, you know, um, survive, reinvention, and resilience. Is that, or resilience, is that correct? That's right. Yep. Yeah. And Joel, so, tell me a little bit about that and also about the resources that you have to help people do just that, survive, reinvent, and and, and have resilience. Sure. So we've started putting information together and we've, we've collected it on our website and we distribute it by way of email to um, subscribers. Um, just trying to provide tips and tricks for um, seeking out sneaky sources of mammal as well as um, just on, you know, ways to reinvent the things that you used to love that you have to give up and replacing those things that, um, that you can't reinvent. You know, not all of us want to eat the veggie bacon fake 
stuff or you know so we find new things to enjoy and and the, the longer that we're at that the longer that we're practicing that we're finding we're getting more and more resilient we're coming back um just stronger than we were before you know um and just being able to find joy more things you know since our diagnosis so you know it, i think it, it, it bears mentioning here especially because you're talking about kind of all the different things you can do to really live a you know, a full life. Um, but everybody's experience, I think, as you said, is different, right? So there are people that, you know, they can't eat organ meat, they can't have liver, right? Or, or tripe, or, but they can eat, you know, a hamburger once in a while, right? And not have symptoms. Um, there are people that just can't eat, you know, what we think of as red meat and, and you know, pork, but have no problems with gel caps or milk. Or, or any of that. So I think it's important for people to know there's a spectrum, right? And not everybody responds the same way, uh, which also makes this difficult, right? If, it, if, if, if everything was black and white and, and the same for everyone, it would be a lot easier to disease or sy symptom or syndrome to deal with. Um, right. yeah. What other, um, inf so I know you, you guys, again, being out there and, and having such a big social media presence, you know, you're, you're exposed to a lot of good information that's out there and a lot of information that we probably should not be following. Um, you know, what, what kind of, um, you know, suggestions do you have for people that are trying to find their way? Well, I would say that you just hit on a, you know, really important piece of this is that everyone is different. So we've seen in some of the larger Facebook groups, just a lot of inaccurate information or just very opinionated information based off of a personal experience. And it just might not be the case for every person. So, you know, based off of my experience of being on the severe side, we tend to speak to the severe you know, realm of things. Um, so I would just say be cautious of just going to Facebook for information. <laughs> um, we really love um, alphagalinformation.org. Um, Sharon, who created work directly with Dr. Scott Commons, and it is, we call it the encyclopedia for alphagal syndrome. And if you need any research, you know, documentation, it is all there. It's mm -hmm. an amazing, amazing resource. So um, I would say that would be kind of our top one. Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's so important to, to really that, you know, I, I with, with, with the onset of so much information, it's very difficult for patients, you know, without extensive medical training to figure out what's, you know, what's accurate, what's not, what's really out there. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely appreciate that. Uh, other sources are, are obviously our Allergy Insider uh, website, which has, has a lot of information on, on AlphaGal, but certainly not as much as, uh, as alphagalinformation.org, which uh, is, you know, solely dedicated to, to that information. Um, so it looks like we're coming up on our 30 minute mark. We don't want to go too much over that, um, but I, I do want to ask you, um, you know, there, there, there's so much need for awareness and I, and I certainly appreciate everything you guys are doing to really bring AlphaGal uh, syndrome into, into the public knowledge. I was great that you guys are on the Today Show. Um, you know, even if it's a small segment, I mean, if we think about that reach, it gets people to really look for other sources. So I definitely appreciate that. It's been a pleasure having you guys today, but I'd love to give you a chance to kind of close out with any, any parting thoughts or, 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 or words that you may want to share. Sure. Um, I think the one thing that comes to my mind is just have self-compassion for, for yourself in this journey. Give yourself grace and patience. Healing is possible. It may just take a little while and, you know, start with a food journal, really, really tap into yourself mm -hmm. because you are your best advocate and you know your body better than anyone. Um, you know, reach out to us anytime. We're happy to help. Um, if people have questions about more details, you know, of products or sneaky sources, any of that stuff. So we're always, always happy, happy to help. Yeah. And I would add to that, just, um, you know, the outdoors can be a really healing place. And we hear so many people talking about not wanting to go outdoors once they have AlphaGal, afraid of another tick bite. And so one thing we say often is to um, don't live in fear, but live aware. So continue to go outside and enjoy that time with nature, but just find a way to do it in alpha safe way, you know, wear your protective gear and proper repellent, incorporate tick checks. Um, yeah. Anything else? Absolutely. Well, 
I, you know, and w one more thing, because I think we touched on it initially, but I want to come back around, right? And that's having that support system, right? And having people that, that, that help you stay empowered. Um, I, I know I, I've listened to, to some of the other things that, you know, talk about how to eat in a restaurant. We don't have time to talk about that tonight, um, <laughs> today. But um, I, I think it's so important, right, to, to address that, but also address the mental health side of things. And, yeah. and I mean, maybe just talk for a minute. I, I, maybe, maybe people will stay with us. Because I, I, it's so important that, because anxiety and an, and an acute reaction can go together, that you can certainly have them both at the same time, but you can just have anxiety thinking, right, or anticipating that you may have a reaction, especially with this delay. So speak, speak to that for a second and kind of the mental health side of things. It's it's so important. I mean, I think Debbie and I both um, were big mental health advocates before our alpha-gal diagnosis. We had done a lot of our own work in that arena. Um, but I will say personally, I developed severe PTSD after my anaphylactic reactions where I, had a, I couldn't drive by myself. I couldn't be home by myself. Um, it was really, really hard. And it can put you in just this very debilitating state. So I would say be open to trying something new. Debbie, you know, brought tapping. She's like, try tapping. It's like a, you know, a fatty relief, you know, um, exercise and um, just try something new for yourself, be it walking, be it, you know, find that person that you can call on to be your first responder. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I can't say enough about mental health. I think we could talk for a whole nother hour about the importance of mental health with this and, and I would just add to that another way that we found to really reduce that anxiety, especially when you're in a reaction, right? If you get that sense of impending doom or something like that, is to be prepared for it. You know, Candace and I have been doing this for a while, but we're not out of the weeds. We still occasionally react to something. And we know that we have our steps in place, our plan in place. We have our support system in place. So the, the people that we know are going to um, help us through our that they're made aware of the plan. And it really reduces that anxiety when you enter into a reaction because it's, it's really when, not if. It, it will often that, happen. That's a fantastic um, you know, call out. I think you know, having an, a, a, an allergy action plan, right? Mm -hmm. um, not just the medical side, but also the people that, that will help support you through that, especially if there's an anxiety component. And you, need, you may need epinephrine, but you also need someone to, to kind of keep you together, right? So I, I definitely, I appreciate that from you. So uh, again, it, this has been great. I, I think we need to do another one of these and get into some of these other areas because there's so many important areas. Um, but, you know, what I do want to say to our audience is, is um, you know, if you don't already, please uh, follow us on, uh, on uh, you know, Allergy Insider, two alpha gals, both on Instagram, uh, like and comment, share this video, um, help us spread awareness. And don't forget to, um, you know, to, to check, um, and check out the most recent Empowered Patient article. Um, we've, you know, we've done this whole series um, and our most recent one features these two wonderful ladies. So, um, I, and you'll, you'll get even more information on this, on this syndrome. So thank you again. And I wanna thank everybody out in, you know, in the audience and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.